Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there was a, a young rabbi who went to his first synagogue, and he noticed as he was there praying in the synagogue on that first Sabbath that the people behind him while he was at the altar were divided. He kind of peeked over his shoulder and he noticed that half of the church was sitting down and the other half was standing up during the prayers. He thought this was a little odd, but he thought he'd just keep moving on with his prayers. But he noticed some murmuring in the background as he continued. It started to get loud enough that he started to make out some words and he noticed that what was happening was that the congregation was in disagreement. The two halves of the congregation were kind of looking over, over at each other and saying, you know, that's not right. You need to be sitting down. And the other half, no, it's not right. You need to be standing up. Well, he thought this was pretty disconcerting, but he thought maybe he would try to avoid uh, taking sides, so he kind of ignored it and thought maybe it would go away. The next Sabbath, as he started the prayers, the same thing happened. Half the church was standing, half the church was sitting, and the people started getting even rowdier. They started yelling at each other, you need to sit down, you're disobeying, you're not being uh, good. And, and he thought it was getting out of hand. So, but he thought, maybe if I talk to people, it will add fuel to the fire. So he tried to pretend it didn't happen. So that week he went and tried to find uh, an old rabbi who had served that synagogue for many years in the past. And he and this elderly rabbi is hunched over and he says, you know, I've been having all these troubles since I got to the synagogue, what should I do? And, he's, and he says, well, what's happening? He says, it, and he, the young rabbi says, is it the tradition of this synagogue to, to stand during the prayers? And the old rabbi is leaning over and he says, no, I, I don't think so, that doesn't seem to be the tradition. And he says, is it the tradition of the synagogue for the people to sit during the prayers? No, that's not the tradition. And he says, well, I don't know what to do. They're yelling at each other all the time. Oh, that's the tradition. That's what they do. <laughs> now, this could be just as true for any church anywhere because people are people and sin is sin. And we love to make our own traditions the thing that others should do as well. Jesus is no stranger to this. This is what happened in our text today. And it's amazing to see how Jesus dealt with this. He is, you know, at the synagogue and the people are arguing with him about how he lives. He tries to be with people so that he might welcome them into the kingdom of God to show them how much he loves them. And so definitely eating with people was part of his ministry. And yet, what happened was he was accused when the Pharisees see him eating without the ritual washing. Now, is it, does it say anything in the Bible about this? Well, I would say that, yes, there is something about this, obviously, because otherwise it wouldn't be an issue in the first place. But you see, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law is what is at issue here. Is there a letter of the law? Does it say? Yes. You can look in Exodus 30 and find how it tells that the priests are commanded to wash their hands before they approach the altar, before they offer the gifts to the Lord. And what had happened through the centuries is that the Pharisees began to believe that if the priests are doing this in order to approach God, then certainly Anytime we pray, we're approaching God, so everybody needs to do this. So they started to impose this idea upon them. So no longer is the spirit of the law the idea that you are to pray. Just like that young rabbi, the spirit of the law would have been that a church, a congregation, whenever we come to the Lord, we are to pray. But the letter of the law is how do we do it? And so sometimes we confuse the how with the why. We think that it's more important the way we do something rather than where our heart is and where we are approaching God. And so Jesus' approach was, of course, that he wanted people to know God. He wanted them to learn about the love of the Father who had sent his own son 
But here these Pharisees are ignoring everything that Jesus is doing and trying to impose a rule that was not meant for everybody but was for the priests and trying to bring them into a type of guilt saying you're disobeying. They were ignoring everything that Jesus' ministry had done up to then. Just the chapter before in Mark's gospel, Jesus had healed somebody miraculously. He had done a good deed. Isn't that a sign that what Jesus continues to do is a healing ministry? Here he is eating with people and he's not washing his hands because that's not what it was commanded. And so these Pharisees try to impose their letter of the law upon him, using it as a weapon against him, trying to overcome Jesus' love by saying that it was the opposite, that he was not loving God by not obeying. But didn't we just hear in Psalm 14 today that none of us can do good, none, no one does what is right, and so the idea that we can appease God by obeying all the rules in the Old Testament never was a possibility. Do you think God knew that people were sinners? Of course he did. So giving the commandments wasn't so that we could find our own way to heaven by being perfect. Now, most people know they're not perfect, but some people seem to, that they miss that memo. But that's true for all of us. There are times in our lives where we ourselves believe that we're in the right, when in fact, we may be wrong. And sometimes we may do something that is right, but we do it in the wrong way. We may be offending somebody or hurting somebody, and we go so far as to alienate other people. And that, of course, that is the hard work of Christianity. It's the heart work. It's loving people even when they're not very lovable. It's being able to carry out God's will even when we're attacked, even when it seems like it's not working, even though we're not liked, even when we seem to be doing the right thing, but people are getting upset with us, and so we push forward thinking that being right is more important. I can tell you in marriage that doesn't work because if you are insisting on being right, you may also be single. You need to compromise, you need to love, you need to forgive. And so that's why marriage is such a good metaphor for God's people. That's what we read about in the epistle today. In Ephesians, God says that a husband and a wife are one flesh. But he says, I'm not talking about man and woman, I'm talking about the church. God has made it so that Jesus is the head of the church and that the church is his bride, and this becomes one flesh in the body of Christ. That's why the church is called the body of Christ, because of this marriage between Jesus and those who believe. So when we approach Jesus, do we come to him with this idea that he is the one who loves us so much, that we want to be together with him? Or are we really focusing on the rules and end up being hypocrites? You see, Christian, Christians today are tempted to ignore sometimes the core ministry, the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. We end up coming across as you got to do it the right way instead of focusing on what's important. You may remember the, uh, uh, the saying from Fiddler on the Roof where uh, Tev Tevya says... Uh, about traditions. He says, they tell us who God is and who we are. And I would say that that is a good definition of what should work in the church. What are the traditions that tell us who God is and who we are? And those most important traditions are the ones that are the best, the good ones, baptism and the Lord's Supper. You see, the word and the sacrament, that is God's word and the sacraments that include baptism and holy communion are the traditions that we don't shove down people's throats, but they tell us who God is. He's a loving God. He gave these things for us to teach us that we're sinners in need of a Savior and that our Savior loves us and has forgiven us. And they teach us who we are, that is that we need Jesus. Now, when we lose sight of those things, we end up falling into the same category as the Pharisees. When Jesus called the Pharisees a uh, hypocrites, 
The word hypocrite comes from Greek that means two-faced. The idea that you're showing one face, but you actually are different. You're saying one thing, but you're doing another. We know that what that's like, you know, when parents tell you to do something like go to church, but they don't go to church, or don't smoke, but they smoke. Anytime we, as kids, see that, we know what that is. Kids can identify hypocrisy like that. But how about ourselves? Do we see it in ourselves? And so we are called by God to recognize this two-faced attitude that we are not to be like these Pharisees. Now, were the Pharisees completely wrong? I mean, why did they start this in the first place? Well, it goes back to their good intentions. After the exile, when the people of God were taken into exile in Babylon, the people decided to come back after Cyrus, the uh, Persian emperor, freed them, and they were able to rebuild the temple. Well, so in the 4th century, they rebuilt the temple, 4th century B.C., and one of the things that the Pharisees did is that they said, we need to identify how we as God's people are different than the rest of the nations. And so the rest of the nations were polytheistic, worshiping multiple gods, and they said, we know there's only one God. So we need to make sure that we follow his word completely. And so they, the Pharisees became teachers of the law so that the people would always know what God's word said. But what happened is that over the centuries, they became so focused on doing it in an exact way that they, as we heard earlier, had taken something that was just washing of the hands for the priests into something that everybody had to do, otherwise they were sinning. And the prophecy about this that Jesus uh, quotes is his way of not just sitting back. Notice that Jesus doesn't defend himself and say, oh, yeah, you know, what I really meant is this. No, he goes on the attack by quoting God's word. And that was from our reading today from Isaiah 29, where it says, you know, that these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, even back at the time of Isaiah, in the 8th century B.C., the people were doing the same thing. They were disobeying God and ignoring him. But they were going to the church. They were going to the temple. They were doing their sacrifices. But they also just did what they wanted to do, thinking that God didn't know. Does it sound familiar? Do we see that in our world today? Not only among people in general, but even Christians fall into the category of thinking that we can just go to church and then on the rest of the week we can do whatever we want. Now, of course, that's not what it means to be a Christian. It has nothing to do with living our own lives and just showing up at church on Sunday. But instead, God calls us to give our hearts, to submit to him and to submit to one another out of love for Christ. If we decide that we're going to live for ourselves, then we're actually putting ourselves first. We become our own God. We're committing the same kind of idolatry that the ancient world did, and our world still does today, worshiping gods that may not be made of stone or metal, but are made of ideas. Gods of power and gods of greed, gods of pleasure, gods of pride, whatever they might be, People are still following those things. But Jesus reminds us that we have a higher purpose, that we've been called to live for him. And in living for him, we have to, uh, we have to come into his presence and our worship is about relating to God and understanding how he relates to us, that he loves us, that he forgives us. And yet, that very good thing of helping people to know who God is some people turn their traditions into the rules that alienate others. Is there a church that is perfect? Is there a, a way of worship that is commanded in the Bible? No. The only things that are commanded in the Bible are the things that in, are included in almost all church services. If you read through Acts chapter 2, it talks about how the early Christians, they met together in each other's homes, they sang spiritual songs, they, uh, they studied the teachings of the apostles, that is the word of God, and they prayed. And so in their prayers and their singing, in their studying the scriptures, there you have a worship service. Anything else we add to that 
might be considered tradition. But the problem with that is when we start insisting that our way is the only way. And so, you know, what Lutherans do is fine and good, but God loves the heart. Is our heart in our worship? Are we here because we want to be in God's house? Do we love what God has given us in his own son? He sent Jesus to die for us. And in his death and his resurrection, he has given us hope. He's given us joy in the knowledge that we are forgiven. And that is that very thing that sends us out from here that we might be able to bless others, to show others how much God loves them. How do we know that what God's will is then when it comes to dealing with other people in the world? The problem is sometimes we think we know better than God's word. That's why it's so important to study it, to know it over and over again so that we might be able to react to things correctly. The Pharisees overreacted and they called Jesus really a blasphemer. How do we react when we see people who are doing things that are against God's will. You know, there are all kinds of controversies even among Christians about abortion, same-sex marriage, and those kinds of things certainly can be very difficult to deal with. And it's not a time to go into them, but I would say that if you wanted to say that the Bible doesn't specifically condemn or say that a person shouldn't have an abortion or shouldn't have a same-sex marriage, that may be true that it doesn't specifically answer things in our world today, but it always talks about the basics. So the fourth commandment, do not murder. The protection of life, the valuing of life is there. The sixth commandment, do not commit adultery. In Genesis 1.26, it says that God brought Adam and Eve together and they became one flesh. And so marriage was God's model. And so in those things we see a truth, but how do we react to others who have a different way of looking at it? Are we going to beat them over the head with God's word? Are we going to shame them or guilt them? Be careful in how you approach these things because we don't want to come across like the Pharisees and insist that other people have to think and do the things that we do. Instead, I think that it's best that we recognize that there are sins in the world. And just as some sins are maybe more obvious, we also fall into that same category. We are sinners. So have compassion on a person who's struggling. Invite them to see how much God loves them. Because when a person feels loved, when they feel that they're safe, then they begin to understand God's calling on their life. And it's not just to go ahead and live your life. What did Jesus say to the woman caught in adultery? Go and sin no more. And so Jesus convicted her, not by telling her she was evil, but by living a different life. When our lives are lives of love, when we're doing the hard work of the heart work, loving others, even when they don't deserve it, even when they're different, even when they have different uh, traditions, recognizing that God can change their hearts and God will work in their lives if only we can get a foothold to let them see Jesus, a glimpse of Jesus then God is doing his work. God is forming in them the spirit of what God intended. We know that this is very difficult and it's never going to be perfect, but that's why we have uh, Jesus' example because Jesus uh, came to remind us that God's giving of the law was to prepare us for him, not to prepare us to follow the commandments, the Pharisees got it wrong when they thought it was all about obeying instead of repenting and receiving the forgiveness of sins. The law reminds us that we're sinners in need of a Savior. And over and over again, we need to be, remind ourselves of that. Only Jesus can save us from sin and death. And so as the Pharisees would come to see that Jesus was leading down a path that they didn't expect, they thought that he was a blasphemer, that he would fight against them, Maybe he would lead an insurrection, but instead, he quietly accepted what God was giving him, the cross, to die in our place. And even his disciples who didn't understand it thought that Jesus would finally call a legion of angels to protect him, 
which he said at the Garden of Gethsemane that he could do, but he didn't because he had to do his Father's will. And his Father's will is that he came to save you. He came to save the world. He came to save sinners who love tradition and law more than God. That may be us sometimes, but may God use us even in our imperfection so that we might show the light of Christ as often as possible. And know that even when our sins are blaringly obvious, that God forgives us as well. Jesus loved us perfectly, and in doing so, he redeemed us and made us children of God. But we know that that description of being children of God, as Jesus talks about in other places when he says in John's Gospel that I am the good shepherd, and he talks about how he came to die, lay down his life for the sheep. Remember, he said, there are other sheep that are not in my fold yet, and I need to bring them in as well. That's what God is calling us to do, to be part of that shepherding, to be able to bring others into God's kingdom in order to make it possible that they would know the love of Jesus. If the law gets in the way, then it just causes problems. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to follow the laws. It just means that the law was never meant to be our salvation. And that's why Jesus talks about the difference between uh, new wine and old wineskins. That expression may be difficult for us to understand, but think about an, an old wineskin, once it's been stretched out from the wine that's uh, fermenting and expanding, then it gets dry and brittle. You put some new wine in that old wineskin, it'll burst and explode. And so the new wine is the new teachings of the gospel. That is, it's not so much that it's new, but it was something that was to renew people from the inside out. And so the teaching of the gospel that God forgives us and loves us and calls us to be lights in the world was something that the, that the disciples struggled with, but the Pharisees especially did. How might putting that new wine into old wineskins apply to us today? It's seen in sometimes the structures that we put so much hope into and we forget that traditions are only to be a way of helping share the gospel. The traditions can never become the gospel. So God wants to do a new thing today in us as well. He wants to use you and me in places that we didn't expect it. And people that we wouldn't think are ever going to believe in Jesus. Why make the decision that a person won't believe in Jesus before you ever gave him a chance to say yes? Have you ever thought of that? the relative or the friend or the co-worker who seems so hostile to the gospel or seems to live such a lifestyle so crazy that you might think they'll never want to know about Jesus. But maybe desperately inside they do. And so as Paul says in Philippians 3, 13, forgetting the things that are behind and stretching forward to the things which are before, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We have a high calling, a high calling of sharing the gospel, of taking this new wine of Jesus' love that he poured out on the cross, that he gives us in Holy Communion, and that gospel message that we continue to live under, not the law, but under the gospel, the forgiveness and the freedom. This is what the world needs. Will you share that? Will you be a, way, a person who will bring it to a world that thinks that we're hypocrites as Christians? Or we'll show them that that's not true, that we walk the walk and we talk the talk because Jesus is all that for us. If we live that way, the world will truly learn to know Jesus. And we hope and pray that God will continue to bring others into his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.